The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm Reagan Kelly, and I am joined this week by two of my very cool co-hosts. Nate Heininger. And your brother, Shane Kelly. And this week, we are talking about Eliza, which is a visual novel game by Zachtronics that came out in 2019. Uh, and I-, I first say that I was surprised. This has been on my list of games to play for the show since it came out in 2019. And it's just sort of been like on my various like notes, app documents and things that I've kept. Um, but recently I put out a little like screenshot of a, a bunch of games that I had been considering covering for the show. And I stuck this one in there and asked folks to like, you know, what, what games from this list do you, uh, do you want to hear us talk about? And I was really surprised that Eliza was the one that the most people said, Hey, yeah, like I want to hear you guys talk about Eliza or I want you to do an episode about Eliza. So here it is. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for uh, participating and recommending this game. I was a little surprised, too. I I hadn't really heard much about this game, uh, and we don't or haven't ever really done a a visual novel uh, like this before on the show. I will say, after playing it, I'm less surprised that this was so highly selected because it really is, I think, an impactful experience Mm -hmm. if if it works for you. So I imagine all the people that, like, recommended it this game this 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 experience really worked for them and they wanted you know and they recommended it to us for that so uh thank you everyone for recommending it i'm glad that we've I, i'm excited to talk about it yeah me too i feel like it's very eliza like that our friends have joined us in the discord and said the short game i'm gonna suggest you try a program called eliza <laughs> i think you'll find it calming <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Uh, so if folks aren't fa- – so the ver- the words visual novel, it- it's very possible that some of our listeners aren't really familiar with what specifically we mean by visual novel here. So I'm going to just sort of explain a little bit about the kind of game that we're talking about here. You know, a-, a visual novel, generally, we're talking about games that are primarily about delivering you story, usually mainly in text form with illustrations and images to go along with that text, but usually not fully animated Um, Most of the time, your main interaction with a visual novel is essentially clicking through dialogue. Um, Very frequently, visual novels will have some form of sort of branching narrative or choices to make or other sorts of interactivity, but it's not really required for the genre. There's a lot of visual novels out there, even quite popular ones, that are essentially just a way of delivering you a story in a more or less linear way that has uh, a combination of text and images, uh, a visual novel. Um, Uh, And this game is probably more towards the less interactive side of visual noveldom than the more interactive side. We've played other games on the show that have visual novel elements. Um, So like, for example, I was thinking about um, Pyre, one of the games that we've really adored on this show that combined visual novel style storytelling with a sports wizard basketball kind of uh, (laughs) gameplay. Um, But uh, or um, uh, Nate, you mentioned um, read only memories as having some visual novel kind of elements to it. Um, but it's this is the first time I think we've covered a game on this show that is just a straight up visual novel. How uh, so? Yes, I, I, I think that's right. But I was thinking, you know, we do an entire month to, to uh, interactive fiction every year, right? And so we're we're pretty familiar with talking about text based, you know, stories. Um, but there is something right. different about this. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's actually a really good point. There's definitely like there's a there's a pretty big uh, overlap between visual novels and interactive fiction. Um, you know, when people talk about visual novels, very frequently they're they're talking about Japanese visual novels, which are a pretty big genre. There's a lot of sort of anime visual novels um, that uh, have a uh, a dedicated uh, but pretty niche following uh, over here. Uh, in the West. Um, 
for right. the listeners, you can't see, but right behind Reagan right now is a is a, a shelf of like forty or fifty different visual novel <laughs> cartridges. I think I think actually the only um, visual novels, like straight up visual novels, that I've played are are um, like of the Japanese visual novel style are some of the ones that like really hit the semi mainstream, like uh, Danganronpa. Eliza, though, let's talk about Eliza. This is an interesting one. I mean, it's it, this is a really once I kind of got my head around what I was getting with this game, because like you said, I'm not a big visual novel uh, person like the, uh, the the game that you're actually playing here uh, feels like an episode of Black Mirror to me. It's the biggest comparison mm. I can do. I can see that. Although I think it's a little bit less like in the Twilight Zone uh, yeah. area of Black Mirror. It is definitely like a story of like near future tech dystopia. Th- this is like a prequel to a Black <laughs> Mirror episode. That's a you know, this is this is everyone talking about like, should we do these things? Maybe they'll go wrong, and then a Black Mirror episode would be like, "Oh yeah, those decisions <laughs> were made a ago, long time. They went yeah. really wrong." Yeah, here, here's here, yeah. Uh, here's the worst possible outcome of what you know the, they were worried about in Eliza. The thing that makes it seem to me like a Black Mirror episode is it's a world that's not quite like our own, and the big difference is a very specific technological innovation. And in this case, we're talking about um, AI therapy which has become like a popular retail business. People will come in and get therapy from an AI through like mediated through these proxies. And the, uh, the lead character of our game starts off as one of these proxies, which is a very interesting job. You basically put on an AI headset uh, and it talks in your ear and tells you what to say to the person who you're giving these incredibly weird short therapy sessions to. Before we get into this, I do want to take a quick second and and do some content warnings because this is a game mm. about mental health. Like there's a lot of themes at work here, themes about tech, but it's primarily themes about tech and mental health. And, um, you know, I think with anything like this, it's worth saying up front that this is a game that deals pretty explicitly with depression the main character is clearly suffering from depression but also she's working in a sort of a mental health care capacity with people who are undergoing various different types of um like uh mental health crises and so if that is something that you uh aren't up for then maybe this game isn't for you uh it's not the it's not the most i mean i I can't speak for anybody else but at least for me it didn't come off as like extremely like uh, distressing. Uh, and I am somebody who's, you know, I've, I've occasionally dealt with some depression. I pers- I have personal experience with mental health care, both online and offline uh, in, you know, in my life. And so I think it's, uh, for me personally, I didn't find anything in this like triggering or, or, or really potentially distressing, but other folks may differ on that. So worth knowing what you're getting into when you get into it. Yeah, and another thing that, you know, I think we wanted to say as we really get into this game, too, is that, you know, this is a visual novel. There's definitely some mechanics that we're going to talk about. There's going to be some graphics and some other things that we talk about that this game does. But we really can't talk about this game at all without spoiling some elements of it, spoiling some of the themes, spoiling some of the story beats early on. Uh, so if if you are listening now and this already sounds interesting to you uh, and you want like a completely clean experience with the game, I recommend pausing now and going and playing it and coming back uh, because I, I I don't know how you talk about essentially a novel uh, without spoiling at least some of it. Now, we are going to do a spoiler break uh, at the end of this conversation where we're really just going to go all in on some of the later themes and some of the endings and things like that. But I. Uh, I, I just I, we wanted to say that you, it's going to be hard for us not to at least spoil some of the themes and some of the uh, elements of this game that you experience. Yeah. So uh, what Shane was setting up there, the the beginning of this game, you know, your your main character, whose name is um, uh, Evelyn Ishino Aubrey, uh, she is returning to Seattle uh, after having sort of bugged out and 
uh, it's a lot of her backstory is left sort of mysterious at the beginning of the game. So I won't get into too much detail here, but it becomes pretty obvious pretty early in the game that she was one of the lead developers responsible for the Eliza project. Uh, Eliza, the virtual therapist, uh, is an AI that was developed by a company called Skanda. Skanda is I think it's sort of a stand in of like Microsoft meets Google. It's based in in Seattle, but it has this sort of like Google like global reach into everyday people's lives. Um, some of the products that they have other than Eliza that are mentioned occasionally are things like email uh, service that's pretty popular uh, and, and and apparently phone OSs. So that's why it kind of like read to me as like a combo of like Microsoft and uh, and Google. And she apparently left the project before Eliza was ever really deployed into the real world. Uh, so she helped develop the AI that that uh, provides this mental health care, but she doesn't really know much about how it's being used. And so that's at least part of why she has sort of returned and is working in this sort of low level. It feels like sort of like gig worker type, you know, Uber yeah. type job uh, where she's uh, these these proxies basically just sit there and read from a script given them, given to them by the AI. So they are pretending to be a therapist. They're not fooling the the participant. They know they're talking to an AI through and through a proxy human being. But uh, but they're just sort of there to be a face to talk to, uh, so that Eliza uh, can talk to human beings without I don't know being a robot. Can we talk about these therapy sessions? Um, just as they're presented in the game for a second. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I wanted to talk about too. It's really interesting. It's really strange. Um, like the, the experience for the player is like you, you're sitting in a chair facing another chair and then the participant, the, uh, patient, I guess, sits down in the chair and starts telling you the details of their life. And Eliza gives the, the player character, um, Sorry, what's the her character's name? That character's name again? Evelyn. Evelyn gives Evelyn these prompts to read, and the session lasts maybe uh, three minutes. And the kind of things that the prompt gives Evelyn to read are all basically questions like, "Well, why do you think you feel that way?" Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's really interesting, and but it it really and then at the end of every one of these sessions. It says, okay, here's a here's a meditation app uh, that I want you to try and uh, maybe ask your doctor about like benzos. <laughs> and yeah. Like, yeah. like this seems like the this seems like the worst substitute having having had, you know, many hours of very valuable talk therapy in my life. This seems like the, a terribly poor substitute for actual talk therapy. I was me. thinking about I think that I think it's I I. I think that that is a purposeful thing in this game part of me was thinking it's just to to move the story along you know because you go through a lot of these therapy Uh sessions and so uh, they have to be presented quickly yeah they have to be presented quickly however it is immediately noticeable how short they are and how almost everybody is prescribed a drug and And everybody not not prescribed they're only recommended that they talk to a doctor about their drug because this ai can't prescribe they can't prescribe but they hope eliza is a pill pusher without a a prescription pad yeah yeah there's a feature request to get it where she can actually uh fill prescriptions so uh i but it is funny because they they talk about uh it always recommends yeah a meditation which is provided to you by the skanda app so the whole thing keeps you in the Skanda, you know, ecosystem. Yeah. So like probably the first big theme of this game is like, is this helping anyone? Like the, there's a, the <laughs> real question is like, this is a, um, this is a world where you can go down to, you know, the corner uh, Skanda location and get mental health care from an AI that is way cheaper and way more available to anyone than actual real from a human mental health care. So on one level, this might be a positive thing for the world. Availability of mental health care being vastly improved. 
quality of mental health care being significantly questionable. Um, and there's some indication that it's continually getting better, that as this is, you know, as this continues, this is all feeding into a corpus that, it, you know, that this AI is using to develop a better model of how human beings work and how mental health care works and being able to provide better mental health care. And I'll say by the end of the game, um, there are some moments where Eliza says some things that it never approaches like, wow, what an insightful thing to say in this moment. But there are some moments where I thought it seems like it's getting better. Um, yeah. But that is definitely a question in this game is like, is this actually helping people or is it actually just you know, like false hope or even potentially harmful? It's funny. Yeah, is it it definitely starts where the 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 person will say something usually pretty uh, emotionally driven. And, uh, and and Eliza will say, and how does that make you feel? And then they'll go into like a bigger, longer thing. And then, and then it essentially asks, and how does that make you feel? <laughs> and, and then they, they, say, they say like three more things. And then they're like, we recommend the soft meadows meditation <laughs> and talk to your psychiatrist or doctor about, yeah, yeah. whatever, you know. <laughs> Medicine. My favorite, my favorite screenshot from this game. Hang on, I gotta find it. My favorite screenshot from this game was um, doing a session for the guy named Harriman, and yeah, he's so he, weird. He, one of his last things he says is, "Oh, sweet dark death." <laughs> And she says, Harriman, I'm going to suggest you try a program called Meadowlands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I know. So, Nate, you were talking about how you felt like this was a sort of like repeating things back to you or like, you know, the, Eliza's whole approach to therapy is basically like, hmm, that's interesting. What made you say that? And then saying the same thing again 10 minutes later. Um, and I thought it's really interesting. Like they, they do briefly mention in the game that uh, Eliza was named after a prior project. Uh, and so I looked that up and it's a real thing. There is a uh, in the 60s, in 1964 to 1966, uh, the, the, a person at MIT created a basically one of the earliest chatbot programs we're talking about in a pre-internet, you know, pre-networked computers world. Um, and it, it, cre it created this program called Eliza, which was a virtual therapist. Now it was done uh, from what I'm reading and I'm, you know, I haven't done deep research on this. It kind of reads as if like this was a bit of a, almost a joke in a way, because like they, it's almost a parody of, uh, of a certain type of therapy um, and chose to write a chatbot that operated in this way because it didn't require the chatbot to have any knowledge of anything outside of the conversation. Um, because, you know, all it would be doing is essentially reflecting the the words that the, uh, the person that is talking to are saying back on it. But it does exactly this. And in, in a lot of ways, what like this 1960s chatbot that was like one of the very first things to make any kind of attempt at, at making a run at the Turing test uh, did is like essentially what Eliza in this game is doing. Presumably Eliza in this super, you know, uh, AI driven futuristic version uh, has more going on behind the scenes, but it's not really apparent, at least not at first. Uh, it really feels like it could just be a chat bot that says, you know, oh, what makes you say that? Or uh, can you think of a ex specific example of when you felt this way or that kind of thing? But I, I thought it was really, really interesting that this, this does sort of tie back to, you know, it, it's very clear that the developers here have done a lot of research about and really thought deeply about the history of like natural language processing and, and computer uh, and human conversation and AI. Um, and all of that sort of feeding into this because it's really full of themes. It's got that history, but it's also full of themes about like contemporary uh, AI and the ethics around it. So I, th I thought it was really interesting to kind of look back. If you look up Eliza chatbot or something like that, there's a Wikipedia article about it and everything with some examples. And you can even talk to it in a browser today. There's JavaScript. That's versions. awesome. I love that level of of research and care with a project like this to, to, to dig that deep. So while we're still talking too about sort of the role of being a proxy, uh, there were a couple of things that I thought were interesting and also just kind of funny. One, like they make a huge point at the beginning that as a proxy, you are not allowed to 
do anything other than just read the script that Eliza says to you, which you have to imagine is pretty challenging, especially because we keep acknowledging that like the, the responses are not like empathetic human responses, yeah. right? They're it's not just like that bad. Like one thing that I thought was interesting is like, I was expecting more situations where they just like are completely inept responses and they're never yeah. offensive or no. like, absolutely devoid of of meaning it's more just like they don't kind of go the extra mile to like asking a person to like to get at their real their real problems yeah well so while the person is talking you have all there's a lot of things going on on your screen so you're seeing a little spot where eliza is like calculating what they're going to say but you're also seeing things like the heart rate of the patient other things about like their eye movement you know things you can tell that it's using to calculate their current mood and and mindset and whatnot and then it also has a a, a, like a running ticker on the other side that is kind of not guessing but seems to be like calculating like the mood or intent of what the person is saying so, you know, it might be saying like angry or ir- irrational or frustrated or whatever. And then Eliza's response will be like, this seems to make you frustrated. Why? You know, so you can kind of see like where it's building these responses. So you're right. It's not uh, it's it's rarely just cold, although sometimes the patients will, you know, say something completely off the wall and Eliza's just like, I don't understand. What did you mean by that? Mm-hmm. Which is pretty funny where you can tell where someone says something yeah. that like is completely outside of the machine learning. Uh, I also loved the bit where uh, Evelyn is talking to uh, Ray. She is sort of the the person who runs the, the, the center that you work out of. Uh, she says, oh, you know, shouldn't we, there should be a way for us to be able to break out of Eliza when we need to and actually be able to say what we want to say. She says, uh, Ray says something to the effect of, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, I think we had that set as like a feature request. I should check with Dan. He's been working on that for a while. And that just gave me such flashbacks to also working in tech where there's like, you know, you get these like really good requests for things. And it's almost always just like one person has it as like a back burner project they're working on for like a major improvement uh so if you work in tech it it definitely this game seems to uh it it has a lot of crossover Mm -hmm. and i i I imagine the writers yeah yeah i imagine the writers worked in tech there's a moment in this game where you're brought into the skanda offices you're whisked away in a car and you go visit uh Roy Nicehair, the the king of Skanda. And <laughs> he um the thing about this scene that really struck me is it has in the writing this sort of perspective of like th- there there's a um kind of an outsider perspective on like the being in a fancy office building where it's like it gives you in scenes where you're not directly engaged in conversation, like you can select things in the background to look at stuff like that. And it's like, I can't believe it's the somebody's whole job to, to make sure this place has, you know, water in the water pitchers and is cleaned up. Uh, it's th- that kind of, that kind of perspective is like, okay, like, th- yeah, but this, this n- main narrator character has worked in this environment, like literally this environment. Right. So it's kind of strange. She is returning to it after basically spending three years kind of in the wilderness. And I think there's a certain interesting perspective there. But I I get what you're talking about. It's that's something that I was going to talk about here is that like so far, we've mostly just been talking about the portion of this story that happens in therapy sessions. Um, Right. But that's really less than a third of the actual time you spend in this game. Like you do a lot of those therapy sessions, but they kind of are like a little coda between moments of uh, of the main character, Evelyn, interacting with many other characters that are part of her basically her former life as as a developer of this product. So she's meeting up with 
uh, like a friend of hers who is one of her, uh, Nora, who's one of her uh, friends who is a developer on the project, who's since quit to become an electronic musician. She's meeting up with um, uh, Roy Nicehair, like Shane mentioned. Uh, what's his name? Um, <laughs> Ra- Rainier. Rainier, yeah. Rainier, Rainier, Rainier. The, uh, the, the CEO of Skanda, who has a real like threatening, I think, vibe. Like he's like, he's like really portrayed as like very, uh, very like emotionally cool tech executive with good suits and, and like, Impressive businessman. Yeah, impressive mm-hmm. businessman. Um, and then there's the like sort of washed up guy who we used to be part of her project, whose uh, name is now escaping me as well. It starts with an S. Soren. Soren, thank Soren. you. Soren, yeah. Soren, who has left the company to start his own startup that is also trying to create tech to help improve people's mental health. But in a very different way, he wants to create sort of uh, brain machine interfaces to create lucid dreams for people uh in order to hopefully influence their yeah. mental states since we're talking characters i have to stop for a minute and enter the first 2021 nomination for dirtbag of the year oh, oh. For Soren. <laughs> really that's a that's Soren, a Soren is okay. amazing yeah. Soren is um like you're already before you meet with Soren, you get a warning that he's a sleaze bag and he absolutely lives up to it. He's he's like he's a very specific a type very... of sleaze bag, though, right? Like he's this he's this like um, almost uh, you know, stentorian, like uh, like white haired, like elder sleaze bag, right? Like he's got a weird vibe. Like gonna gonna talk about sex at work doesn't matter what you like if you've told him not to kind of sleaze bag. My very very favorite Soren moment. Very favorite thing is that there's a scene, I think this is in a, in every playthrough. I don't know whether you end up with this bit or not, but there's a scene where uh where Soren and Evelyn are having dinner and he uh or you there, there she was previously invited to go see Nora do a a show mm. at like a club like a like an underground uh you know music yeah, club yeah one of my favorite scenes one of my favorite scenes of the game it was is really Evelyn neat. Evelyn enjo- uh, hearing essentially EDM for the first time right? is, is but, very funny. But before that, when he's saying like, yeah, we should go, like you and I should go together to see Nora. It's not a date unless you want it to be a date. It could be a date. But then he warns you that the club that Nora is playing at, he's he sort of warns you that it has a, uh, it's a theme, you know, it's a themed club. It's a, mm, how do I put this? Uh, you know, a certain subculture. It's an S&M club. It's, it's a bondage club. And then you get there and there's no bondage anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Which means he went to a bondage. He went, he went on bondage there. night. He thought that was just it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very funny. Uh, the, the thing about Soren to me that also is f- fabulous. And we, we should have to talk about the voice acting for all yeah. of these guys. But it seems like the casting director basically had written in for, for Soren. Uh, give me a George Carlin type. Because they found somebody that sounds exactly like George Carlin. I yeah, thought interesting. they interesting. didn't put that together, but you've got a point. I, 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 I thought he was going to start telling me the seven words you can't say on television or that like women are crazy and men are stupid. And then the reason that that women are crazy is that men are stupid. Yeah, like I, <laughs> that's funny. You guys, So I, I definitely I thought of Soren as almost like the you know, the like Steve Jobs archetype who like <laughs> you know his his goal is like bigger than how reality actually works mm. but he's also a sleaze bag you yeah know? So this it's like is a really like wild i mean all his, three like, of us have worked at apple we can now we're, we're out of our nda we can talk about the fact that steve jobs used to take all of us to bdsm yeah, clubs. <laughs> this is true this is true uh but but shane so you 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 said it i we've been talking about this game for like a half an hour now, and we've started talking about all these different characters, and we we have to talk about what is maybe the best part of this game, or at least one of its defining features in my mind, which is how good the voice acting is. So good. It, it is incredible, and almost the entire game is voice acted. Now, there's a lot of Evelyn inner monologue that is not voice acted, mm. uh, and there's some like scene descriptions and things like that that are not voice acted. But everything else 
every character interaction is voice acted and it's fantastic. It sounds great. The voice actors do a fantastic job. It's I, I think it's really the only game that I've played that has full voice acting that I actually like let play and would really engage with the voice acting more than the script that's on the screen. One, because they just did so well, but also they, the, the voice actors really own the characters and speak and the, their line delivery was so unique and in a way that I don't think I would have read it. And they even have little like pauses and little other like inflections and other things that they say that are not necessarily exactly uh, dictated on the screen. So it, it really is its own experience. So I, I it, it's probably the best voice acting I've heard in a game just across the board, let alone Definitely something up like there, this. Yeah. yeah. And something about that, like I would 100% recommend that people play this game on auto advance. Um, unlike some visual novels I've played, you actually have to go into a menu to turn that on. Normally you click to advance each line of dialogue, but you can go into the menu and turn on auto advancing, which basically just lets the lets the dialogue play out. Um, and it does it at a, at a very good pace. There is a history function if you want where you can like if you missed a line or if you you know looked away from your screen for a second and and missed a missed a line of like uh, Evelyn's internal monologue or a scene description, um, you can go back and read those things and it's pretty easy to get to. Uh, but I found that the most engaging way for me to play this was to basically just let it play like a movie for most of the time that I, I played it. I turned it on to auto. And that meant that like I was really engaged with the voice actors more than I was like staring at the text and I could look at the illustrations and I'll be honest, occasionally look away from the screen if I needed to, to for something else and continue to sort of let it play out. And I really, really enjoyed engaging it with it that way because, you know, mainly the voice acting was so good. But also I've sometimes found that with really dialogue heavy games like visual novels, of course, sometimes just the act of like clicking the mouse hundreds of times to get through text in a scene um it becomes a little wearying like i don't read that way when i read you know when i'm when i read actual text i kind of take in a paragraph at a time um you know I, I i'm not exactly a speed reader but like something about the act of like clicking to advance dialogue one sentence at a time through lengthy dialogue scenes in many games kind of puts my brain to sleep. Whereas like the, the audio here really kept my ga- brain engaged. Yeah. It, you And you said earlier that like, there's not a lot of interaction in this game and, and compared to like, you know, most games that's true, but the, you do, there is a lot of uh, conversation decision-making. You are very true. frequent, frequently selecting what Evelyn is going to say out of a list of a couple things. Uh, both in face-to-face conversations, but there's also text messaging plays a big role in this game. And you're very often selecting what your text message response is going to be. So you can't like completely just like set your controller down and play through this whole game. One incredibly minor annoyance, but it was still an annoyance I had with this game, similar to what you were just kind of talking about, Reagan, is that there are times where like you have to respond and there's only one option for you to respond and at least on Switch, which is what I played this on, you actually had to hit up on the joystick to select the one thing that was there for you to select and then <laughs> no, hit, yeah. hit hit A to select that piece of dialogue. And even that like extra input command was kind of sep- like disjointed to me. And I got, it was really annoying to constantly have to press up and then A to select the one thing. And what I really wanted to do was just be able to keep hitting A. This is super minor, but it it did stick out to me for the game that delivers its content to you so seamlessly. I kind of hated having to keep hitting. I I agree, but I also thought like that was, I think, done for a pretty specific reason. What you're describing there, um, I believe it only had those options where those times where you would have to choose one uh, one dialogue option from a menu of one. Uh, that only happened in the times when you were acting as a proxy, and I I felt like it was kind of enforcing to you like. Every time you do this, you are choosing to sit to read from the script. It's more than just hit A to advance dialogue. And it also implied that, well, there's definitely, and you kind of could guess this from the beginning, there's definitely going to be a time uh, where Evelyn is going to have the option in the narrative to choose not to stick to the script, right? So was that, so 
was it it was only that during yes. the, the yeah. therapy? Um, okay, I must, I must not have put that together. But so that makes more sense. I did when I was playing. I was like, this feels so obvious. There must be a reason for it. Um, but I mm-hmm. did not make the connection that it was only happening during the therapy session. Yeah. So. If you uh, if you had uh, dialogue choices to make at non therapy times during the game, I'm pretty sure they always had multiple options. And um, the fact that it doesn't have any of them like pre-selected for you is probably a good usability thing too so you you know because if you're hammering a to get through dialogue you don't want to accidentally just choose the default yeah. choice on dialogue choices every time so it does make That's you fair. like do something in order to get your cursor where you want it to be before you continue okay i'm wrong <laughs> <laughs> i have fully defeated my co-host yes yeah uh, yeah yeah shame so I I want to talk about the themes of this game. Like we've talked about um like the the sort of broad stroke stuff here of the story. Uh the 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 overall story, although it has like there's a lot of scenes, there's a lot of dialogue. Um it has a bit of a Evelyn herself feels like she's in a bit of a holding pattern where she's she's working this sort of dead end job that's loosely related to her old job. Um and she's coming out of a long period of depression. And it's, you know, she's trying to figure out like, well, what do I do next? Am I going to, you know, am I going to continue with my old line of work or, am, you know, what am I going to do next in my life? And it has this sort of like holding pattern feel to it. So one of the themes is this sort of theme of depression and 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 uh, and kind of tr- trying to face that and try to move on. I, I I don't know actually how well this game nails that as a theme, though. Like, what what do you guys think about its its approach to like mental health and depression? And like any good game, it's kind of asking you to think about these things for yourself. So I'm not sure if the game necessarily has like a perspective on on the specific question of like is Eliza helping people with their mental health or not. Um, but like that was a big kind of thing I thought about throughout the game is like is the idea of automating mental health even a even a good idea even if it were done incredibly well yeah it's tricky and I only very recently you know played I was playing pretty much up until we recorded so even some of this game is still sitting with me and I feel like you know, I, I, that's part of the problem with doing a weekly game show. You know, it's like sometimes I wish I could play this game and sit on it for like three weeks and then come in and talk about it. So I think some of my thoughts on what this game is trying to say and some of it and what it, and how it actually does it probably a little half baked. Uh, People do yeah. like us for our hot takes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, hot takes I think on two year old games. <laughs> yeah, I, I right. I think that access to health to mental health care is a huge problem. So I think like, you know, what they are, the the grandiose effort of what they say Eliza is doing is is noble and is good. Now, whether it's actually doing that or not, or if it if it's doing more harm than good, I don't know. You know, I, I it's hard to say. I think part of this whole game is that it's in its infancy, even as it as it as it's presented to us, it's in its infancy, right? It's mm-hmm. it's only been going for I don't know if they say an actual amount of time, but you know it's been like less three than three years. years that it's yeah, or you less yeah. no less than three years because she dropped off the project after three. So right. like yeah, presumably right. it's been like in the marketplace for like yeah. a couple of years max. So to answer your question about whether it's important, whether it's worthwhile to automate mental health, I mean, this opens up this huge area of like uh, of of discussion about like what really is mental health? Like, so so am I mentally healthy if I am just happy? Like, what am I mentally healthy if I am a functioning member of society, what does that mean, right? So so how can you automate something that is truly an interpersonal thing, right? That like if if a if an AI determines me to be mentally healthy, like what does that mean if I'm still uh, you know, terrible to the people Feel around bad. me? Yeah. Like 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 the guy who you give therapy to who's like cheating on his spouse or uh, so I don't know. It's, it, it's a really tough thing to say, but 
I, I think this game comes at it from a lot of different directions. Like you see a lot of different people trying to take different approaches. You got Soren's like, what if we rewire the brain to be happy? I thought the thing he said, oh man, this was this was weird. And I keep keep harping on Soren because I guess I just liked that character, Dirtbag of the Year 2021. But <laughs> um, he, he said he, he wanted to end his own suffering, but he didn't have the guts to do it in the traditional way. Mm, yeah. Basically... Basically, he's making an, an 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 analogy between this quote unquote mental health technology that he's developing and suicide, like it is suicide. So, uh, to 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 rewire his brain in this way. So, I think lots of people have this um, this kind of relationship between the idea of like having your brain messed with by a machine and that being kind of the end of you as a person. And, like, this is a game that really wants to discuss that. This yeah. is one of the major anxieties that people have about mental health care in general. Like, you know, this, that's why a lot of people mm-hmm. feel they don't want to to seek mental health care, if, even if they're suffering, is because they feel like maybe that suffering is part of their personality and changing it would be a, would be a betrayal of themselves. Or, you know, very much people have this feeling sometimes about uh, taking drugs for mental health care. So... You know, I, 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 you know, I'm not an expert on that field, but like that definitely rang true to me. Uh, there's there's yeah. so many like ethical pitfalls related to Eliza as a product. Like obviously there's there's like that stuff, the idea of like, you know, taking the humanity out of what is basically a like a really human uh, thing. Uh, there's also, though we didn't talk about like the the really terrifying privacy and other sort of just like uh, practicality dangers related to Eliza. So one of the things we learned pretty early about Eliza is that Skanda is obviously a company that does a lot of things. Eliza is one of their products. And um, it's the Eliza project isn't just about, you know, altruistically providing mental health care to people. Uh, the, The CEO sees this as the beginning of a broader push for strong AI. So like he believes that, uh, that Eliza's AI having access to an absolutely massive amount of information about how people think, uh, you know, their, their, you know, their problems, their words and and actions, but also, uh, things like their, uh, their, you know, their biometric data while they're sitting in the, in the chair, getting their therapy session. And even later in the game, it's revealed their, uh, their device data, their emails, like he's getting people to give him access to their texts. And all of this is going into a massive corpus that is going to, you know, improve Eliza's ability to provide care, sure, but also create an AI that can function as a personal assistant. Wouldn't that be great as a product if we create this strong AI that knows how people think and can act for them? But then, well, where else does that go? Where, you know, this Ed, this guy has some really uh like uh this, west this coast broke da- that part of it breaks down for me because i have to stop mm-hmm. here because what he's basically saying is um we're conducting this bizarre retail therapy operation in order to collect enough details about how people feel to in his words create an ai that's capable of writing a poem and then we shall enslave it to do our taxes. <laughs> I mean, he has actually <laughs> quite a lot more complex feelings than that. Um, like, but that is that the idea is like, yes, we're but he, his whole idea is like this very he, he reads is like uh, a little more Elon Musky to me because he has these <laughs> sort of moonshot ideas about like it, he kind of says later in the game, like, uh, you know, what is a what is a person as rich as I am? interested in they're interested in doing something that changes the world like how much can i move the needle on what it is to be a human being basically and and a big part of that is he he feels that he is ushering in uh you know the singularity more or less like he thinks that eliza is like the the current uh state of the art of like machines thinking like people and he wants to push that as far as he can he wants eliza to be as as human-like and as strong AI-like as he can possibly make it with the hopes that eventually this thing will become a thinking machine that eclipses humanity and ushers in a sort of next layer of, you know, a next level of, of human existence um, or, you know, or becomes a, a new being, right? And that's this like crazy like moonshot idea, right? Like this thing barely can carry on a conversation, 
But that's also like, that's a very tech dude thing. Like tech dudes get real concerned about ideas like uh, Rocco's Basilisk, right? Oops, I just talked about it. Now I've screwed up. Uh, I've, I've ruined it because now I'm I'm part of the problem, right? And if you know about Rocco's Basilisk, it's this really bizarre idea. But like, there are tech bros out there who like really firmly believe in this in this um, fantasy, right? And and I'm I'm not here to say that like I think that the entire idea of the singularity is like a fantasy, but it, it kind of is. Like it's it's so divorced for it's a, such a science fiction like divorced from reality idea that like like the idea that somebody is like making it a core part of their like personal strategy for their business is like a bizarre thing, but also very tech guy. Um, it, so I, I thought he was really really interesting as a character and and like that side of it, the privacy and also sort of like AI angle on Eliza was a very interesting part of the game for me. Yeah, well, it, it, but it's also just like super cliche tech guy because you know they get up on a stage and present a technology as like earth shattering. You know, we, we all we've already mentioned it, we all worked at Apple and we're all pretty big Apple fanboys. Uh, but you watch one of their keynotes and they're like, this is literally going to change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, iOS 13, you know, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. cool, sure, fine. It works slightly better than than the now, one before. Siri but, can tell you who won the sports game. Yes. Yeah, right. So they, you know, they speak in this huge language about changing the world and then the actual product is cool and good or whatever, but it is like a fraction of the presentation. And, and you and you can't argue with the fact that like at the broad arc of Apple as a company has done a lot sure. that's changed the world. But like, yeah. yeah, like the individual product and its moment of development is like never as spectacular as its presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Like every year the the new phone or the new whatever is the single greatest thing that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. But the other right? thing about it that feels very tech guy to me is that like there is that sort of public persona of like here is the next great product and we've we we poured our heart and soul into this product that's going to improve people's lives. But then of course there's enrich enriching lives. Enriching lives. lives. Uh you know and providing care sorry Apple. and and then the other side of it is like that exact thing is is done for like well we did it because we didn't want to you know we we wanted to have a product that competed with a similar product by google or whatever right like it it's all it's all tech business and there's this uh there's this sort of like there's multiple layers to the presentation and the way people talk and think about these things and and he uh rainer is like the epitome of that you know he can stand on a stage and talk about uh you know eliza providing great care uh and he can also then have dinner with you and talk about eliza becoming uh literally a machine god right like <laughs> the 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 layers of it of him are are very interesting to me it felt like every single character in this game was dealing with some form of depression. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And I thought that was really interesting from, you know, Rainer and his uh, obsession to uh, Evelyn's indifference and inability to inability communicate. To almost choose things. Yeah. Almost every single dialogue decision there's almost always an option of like, uh, or maybe, eh, I don't know, maybe, yeah. Um, you know, there's a, a, almost to Nora, who is a really interesting character, uh, also a former employee of Skanda, the, the musician, and uh, Ray, they all have their own versions of either active depression or what they're doing to manage their depression. Uh, and I just thought that was really, really interesting and written in a really thoughtful and nuanced way that like that everyone has their struggles, right? And that like you can be the, uh, you know, a tech billionaire, you can be a person who just like works in the shop, uh, you know, works at like the low level of the tech billionaires like empire. 
Uh, and everyone has their own version of their own mental health that they're, they're dealing with and coping with in their own way. Yeah. And I just thought that was really thoughtful and, and I think pretty delicately handled uh, and I think r- really nice. And that's one of the themes of this game that I'm you know, struggling to articulate, but I, I really appreciated that that effort. I agree. And I, I thought, you know, even even in the moments where you were like providing mental health care via like being a proxy for Eliza, all of the patients, you see most of them multiple times. And, uh, you know, you kind of get a, a, a picture of what their what their struggles are. And all of them read as like real people to me. Like yeah. they, they really like there's there's yeah. the main um not the main there's the one woman who who's like a cartoonist or some other kind of like uh like uh like I think she's a comic artist of some kind um and she's struggling with feeling that like her uh you know her life it, her work isn't becoming popular in the way she wants and she's got a lot of like jealousy with uh, other people working in her same space and and feelings of inadequacy and depression but she also like is a really funny person she has this sort of like it's it's a it's a kind of a kind of depression you don't see like reflected in media very often which is like this is a person who's like really really a funny and an interesting person who is also struggling really struggling and uh and you know it, it is able to really it, it brings across to her like like self mockery or that kind of stuff while also being really raw um yeah and and all of the characters were sort of like interesting in those ways like there's that one guy like Haraman or Haraman or whatever his name is who's like a um like a he's cheating on his wife he's like a um he's like an English uh uh grad student and he's yeah, like working on his PhD yeah and he's um he's struggling with like not wanting to feel like a cliche because he's falling into this like perspective of like being the like English major guy who cheated on his wife and you know he doesn't want to like be the guy who like he, he said something like I don't want to be the guy who you know who uh, uh, publishes one book and it's all about how women rejected him or something like that yeah. um, like all of these are like they're characters that felt pretty unique and real to me and they had mental health struggles that felt real to me in a way that like is uncommon in games or writing yeah well it's easy to write a depressed character as like, oh, I, I don't want to get out of bed. And and that is a version of depression. And there are elements of that in this game. Uh, but f- it's far more nuanced than that. And it's this game really takes care to make sure that I think it's trying not to present mental health in a cliched way. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, and it really succeeds at that. You know, there's, yeah, there's one other sort of theme that I, I I left me thinking about a lot with this game, um, and it it came up mostly because there's a side character named Erland, um, who is like a junior engineer working at Skanda. Apparently, once Evelyn left Skanda and left the uh, the Eliza project, they basically just brought in like one junior engineer after another uh, to like keep Eliza running. Um, uh, well, yeah, he is, he is a junior engineer, but his role is that of a highly senior engineer. Right. He is the head of the Eliza project. He graduated college and his job out of college is leading the, is the head engineer of the Eliza project, which mm-hmm. is crazy. That blew my mind. I was like, what? Why does your company suck so much? I, I think it, I think it reflects like how uh, Rainer is like basically like tr- I think Rainer is trying to like run things behind the scenes. He doesn't want anybody with like strong opinions uh, like messing with Eliza. Uh, and I think that's also well, why he's like trying so hard to to get you back on board is he feels like uh, like uh, Evelyn has like, you know, something that he wants to like move Eliza forward. But it is really weird. I have to say yeah. one thing that got mentioned at one point about Evelyn, which just didn't even seem to fit for me. But what is that that Evelyn was uh, when she was being a proxy, they said like the customer satisfaction ratings and like her score in terms of improving people's lives. However, they measure that it was unclear were were off the charts were just she was the best proxy that had ever proxied. And that she's helping people, like, she's changing people's lives by doing this, by 
by reading the script in a slightly different way than maybe somebody else would have met read the script. And that just seems so weird to me. Like, what what is going on with that? Like, it's certainly not reflected in any Im- positive improvement. I don't think any of the patients, like, dramatically turned their life around. Well, uh, I don't necessarily you know, think it was, that I you know, I don't, I don't remember the game ever saying, like, she was changing lives. But I do remember what you're talking about. And I think it kind of just came down to, like, she cared about it. Like, there's one moment later in the game. I won't spoil any details about it. But there is there is a scene towards the end of the game where you sit in as a patient with an Eliza session. And one of the things that really stuck out at me about it was that the other proxy was basically it sounded like they were reading from a card, right? Like it really sounded like they were kind of like disaffectedly reading a script. Whereas like Evelyn cares. And I think that's really all that's trying to get across is like Evelyn cares, not just about um, like she cares about the person sitting across from her in those sessions. And she also cares about Eliza as a product. She wants to know how it's being used. You know, she wants to know the effect she's had on the world. So she really cares about it. Um, so I think that's basically all that was really getting at, but, um, I don't know. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it still didn't, still didn't make her get good tips. <laughs> her tips were still shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was really funny. You get like, badges and tips and and ratings as being a proxy yeah that was weird so what i was getting at before though um was that erland the character that is kind of taken over the the um the the eliza program he's really idealistic and one of the things that he keeps coming back to in conversations with evelyn is that he wants to like honor the people that he wants to make sure that the the data set that makes up Eliza isn't misused, and he wants to he so you know Eliza is is like basically absorbing all of this information from all of these uh you know uh, all of these patients essentially, uh, and that's all becoming part of its corpus, its data set that makes up its ability to understand the world, um, and he sort of feels like it's really important to make sure that that data set isn't misused, not just for privacy reasons, but to sort of honor the stories of the people that are, that make up this data set. And that made me really think about the way that AI works today, which is that it it relies on these massive data sets, these corpuses of information that is, you know, most, most AIs that we have today, most of these kind of like products like GP3 and, and whatnot, they're all based on this idea that you feed in a large amount of information and this sort of mm-hmm. machine learning draws connections in ways that maybe aren't completely understood even by the people that program the AI um, so that it kind of draws its own map of this data set that you've provided with it. And then it tries to extend that map by creating other things that sort of fit its own internal way of of thinking about the data set that you fed it right um and what that means is that you've got these situation where you know if you want an ai to do something interesting you have to give it a bunch of real information real stuff and that prov- presents a lot of like ethical questions that we're even seeing already now with like real ais um, I, the things that it's made me think of most specifically are like, uh, have you guys read about the Enron corpus? There's that terrific episode. Of, we've all listened to the same episode of 99PI, haven't we? Uh, yeah. 99% invisible. I, Reagan, I'm sure you can find it and put it in the show notes, but really, really interesting episode about the Enron corpus. Also, sidebar, corpus. Yeah. That's what a word. What a word body. for this, I know, right? It is like, kind of weird, but it's the, it's the, it's yeah. the term of art for this sort of thing. I know. If, it you, is, if you look but... up Enron Corpus, there's a Wikipedia article about it. But the, the, the basic idea, I would recommend that, that 99% invisible episode if you want like the full story. But like the, the basic idea is that like, you know, Enron was that company in, in Houston. I, well, I was around at the time uh, that, uh, that, basically committed a bunch of fraud and went out of business. And as part of the uh, sort of enforcement actions against them, uh, all of their corporate email for years that had been stored on their servers was released publicly as sort of a public domain data set. And anyone can go and download. It's like gigabytes worth of of real emails by people that worked in Enron for the years leading up to its going bankrupt. And um, because it's a bunch of real emails by real human beings, massive quantities of them. Um, 
you know, they are, that is a really valuable tool for people who are doing AI work that involves real human communication, email and otherwise. This is a bunch of examples of how real human beings write to each other. Um, and so yeah, like the, uh, the Google predictive text, when you're sending an email that was built off of and influenced by the Enron email corpus. Yeah, or pretty much every mm-hmm. spam filter that's ever been is like trained on this as a data set. Uh, yeah, things like it's Siri wild. and other other like things that are meant to sort of rec- understand real human uh, speech often use this as part of their you know their understanding of the world. But of course, they're real emails by real people, and they include you know, work emails, yes, but also personal ones that include things like, you know, uh, people writing to their, uh, their estranged spouses and things like that, things that would be pretty private, but weren't. And we're including people talking about affairs that like the messy details of real human life are just full in these people's correspondence. And they were all just dumped as a part of this, uh, lawsuit. And there was also, there's, and there's, real problems with it too because a, a vast majority of the employees of Enron were white males so like a lot of what we've used to create these AIs are built off of the language of like white males from the 90s yeah so there's all which, these ethical like uh, layers to this is like was the ethical responsibility to those people at Enron many of whom were committing no fraud or doing no wrong and just happened to be working for a bad company and had their personal uh, emails or at least work emails that might have contained personal information released publicly but not just released are perpetually a part of uh of of systems that uh that are you know used by millions and millions of people and then there's other aspects like what Nate was talking about like the responsibility to use these corpuses in a way that doesn't create uh you know things that are unethical later like you know creating an AI that has biases based on the things that have been fil- filtered into it um and then I was also thinking about this in terms of something that we almost covered for this show, uh, things like AI Dungeon. You know, AI Dungeon is a uh, a similar system in that, like, it, it's a uh, yeah. I think it's GP three or or some similar uh, like uh, you know a, a machine learning algorithm where they've fed it a bunch of text based games, the text of a lot of different uh, games, and uh, and it's able to sort of create on the fly, uh, you know, interactive narratives. Uh, using that as a basis and very often it's like seemingly entirely original but ultimately it you know underneath the hood it's essentially remixing a bunch of real people's actual work who didn't necessarily consent for their words their work their writing to become a part of this new product Um, so there's all these like really thorny ethical issues and when it comes down to like what if it was your emails what if it was your therapy sessions going into this that just opens up so many ethical questions eliza i want to enable transparency mode (laughs) or all of everything might have been done ethically and with the right intent by the people who initially created the technology like an evelyn however we're now 20 30 years later or a company merges gets bought out The CEO changes all these different things that like, you know, once you create something like this, how do you maintain the integrity of it for forever? Forever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a real challenge. Yeah. That corpus that's being used today to, you know, used from mental health care sessions to provide mental health care sessions that has a that has a feeling of being an ethical thing to me, Um, you know, with informed consent. Decades later, you know, maybe or even immediately later, Rayner wants to extend the usage of that corpus to include uh, to create, you know, commercial products that are unrelated to mental health care. And of course, he has other yeah. weirder aspirations for it down the line. But like that, so many ethical questions about AI and the use of AI and the use of the data that we use to make AI are are raised by this game. Um, and it just really left me thinking about that stuff afterwards. Like I, I know the the probably the main themes of this game are about like uh you know mental health and and stuff, but like this really left me thinking a lot about like the ethics of AI. Yeah, well and just tech like I I, I think we could talk about this for five more hours probably. on this show. Right. I I think 
what this game does so well is pack this all these themes into a compelling story. It's like uh, I thoroughly enjoyed going through each of this and and the voice acting carries it through e- you know piece by piece and you're constantly thinking uh yeah, I, I I don't know what the bigger theme of this game is, the mental health element or the the like, you know, the tech industry and the ethics of, of you know, big tech. I, I don't know if there's one that's bigger than the other, but they are they are major and they are in the, the game takes huge broad swipes. While also being incredibly nuanced at the yeah, same time, yeah. it's a, it's a real accomplishment. It really is. I, I think we uh, we probably do need to um, move on to our spoiler break if we're going to briefly talk about some of the endings uh, and stuff. Uh, we probably aren't going to yeah. talk about all of them. I don't think we've even played most of them. Uh, I've, uh, but I, I can talk a little bit about a couple of things I found surprising. If you want to stick around after the spoil break, spoiler break, stay with us there. Before we do, one thing I forgot we should probably talk about: the solitaire. So this is a game, we didn't even mention the developer at the start of the game. This is from Zactronics. And uh, I I have not really played any Zactronics games because I'm not a puzzle game person. But like Zactronics, this is their first, as far as I know, only, um, you know, visual novel. They primarily do these popular, really in-depth puzzle games that are like programmery puzzle games. So for example, um, like one of the ones that's been most popular is like the uh, Infinifactory and Shenzhen IO and um, Space Chem. Um, and these are all puzzle games that are about like building and operating systems that do complicated things, programmery types of puzzle games. Um, and as a sort of an escape valve in all of their games, they all traditionally have a solitaire game built into their game and uh, they they pride themselves on doing a new original different variation on solitaire in every one of their games so every one of their games has a solitaire game on it, in it and they're all different and i did not know that i love that's so awesome this so this game's no different than i didn't i didn't know that the the uh developers have a history of of solitaire games but this is awesome so in this, this game, a good one yeah it is. you have a uh, uh evelyn has a cell phone we talked about it earlier you're constantly sort of engaging with it for a variety of different reasons but always sitting in there is a solitaire game that you can play uh it has different difficulties it's sort of like a free cell uh you know sort of match for uh it's it's a solitaire game but mm-hmm. it's a lot of fun it looks really really nice and i found myself wanting to play the solitaire game uh because i love solitaire games but also what like you know, I needed to get through the story for the for the podcast. So uh, I was just I was surprised at how much I actually enjoyed the little solitaire game. It, it, it's great. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I really liked it, too. You said the cards are pretty and they are. They are. Um, I, I looked this up and they are a real. I thought they were Hanafuda cards, but they weren't a style that I recognize. So I looked them up. And they're actually not. They are a different type of Japanese playing card called uh, Kabufuda cards. Um, but they're all very, very attractive looking cards. Uh, and uh, it's a deck of 40 cards in like four, uh, four houses or, or suits of like 10, I think, uh, or maybe I'm mixing that up or sorry, you know, there's 10 suits of four, 10 suits of four. Yeah. yeah. And, um, they're really pretty. They're neat. And I enjoyed the solitaire too. And I kind of wish they would release this as its own separate game. They've done that once before in the past, the, the solitaire from, I think Shenzhen IO, uh, was released as its own separate game on mobile called Shenzhen Solitaire, and you can download it and play it outside of Shenzhen IO. Um, oh, nice. I wish they'd do it for this one, too, because it's actually a pretty good Solitaire game. But um, It is. It, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, would, I would play it on its own. So before we go to our spoiler break, uh, thank you for listening to The Short Game. Uh, you can find our show on the internet at www.theshortgame.net, where you'll find our contact form and other ways to get in touch with us. Uh, you'll also find a link to our Patreon, patreon.com slash the short game, where you can at even a dollar a month uh, support the show and get instant access to our discord which is where we talk about the games we're playing uh we plan we uh we talk to people about what games we ought to be playing and uh we chat about all sorts of other stuff too so if you want to join us on discord we'd love to have you um just uh, head to patreon.com slash the short game and support us at any level uh and uh of course you can find our show on twitter at underscore short game or you can find me on twitter at reagan k that's r-a-y-g-a-n-k nate where can people find you 
You can find me on Twitter at Nate STL. And Shane, where can people find you? Also on Twitter at 8BitShane. And here it is, your spoiler break. So I don't want to go through every ending, but I did want to talk a little bit about the way the endings are are structured, because I thought that there, there's one thing about this game that I thought was very merciful to me in terms of your time. And that is that when you get to the very end of this game, uh, I've played other visual novels that have multiple endings and very often the options or choices that that cause you to branch into various different endings are kind of peppered throughout the game. Um, and so when you get to the end of the game, you are, you know, shuttled or funneled into an ending based on all of the choices you made throughout the entire game up to that point, um, which is a perfectly reasonable structure, but it kind of means that f- at least for me, I'll never, ever see those other endings. This game yeah. has a different structure that I, I think has a feeling of being maybe a little less naturalistic or, or interactive, but also really felt like it was providing me the choices that I wanted, which is that you get to the end of the game and there's a final scene where, or not a final scene, but there's like a final big choice where you can choose which character to spend sort of the last night of the game with. You know, do you have a a, a final dinner with Raynor? Do you go and hang out with Nora, et cetera? And you can choose between all of the characters, even Erland. Um, And then after that scene, you get a choice between five endings. And it really does basically just present you with a choice of, of five options. It, I appreciate this system uh, because often visual novels are pretty long. You know, this one's relatively short, part of why we were able to cover it, which we didn't really talk about before uh, the spoiler break. But uh, I like this ability to go back and see these different endings pretty quickly instead of needing to play the entire game yeah. over and yeah. like and i sorry i don't have i don't have couldn't find the screenshot i was just looking for it but you you uh, you basically get a choice between like well what do you want to do with the rest of your life and you have a choice of five options and there are things like you know go back to skanda and work with uh with rainer or uh you know uh, go uh live with Nora and work on playing music or um, go uh, continue working as a proxy uh, with Ray until you are able to get your uh, psychiatrist's license and become an actual therapist, uh, which is one of the options that I chose because it felt like it, that really felt like a good ending to me. Um, I, uh, live with Nora and play music is clearly the, 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 optimal outcome here that's the the best one yeah well i i I really liked nora but like i don't know something was off about her Uh, anyway i i ended up um i think she's a russian spy (laughs) very likely um yeah i I really liked the endings and i i found the uh the rainer ending extremely surprising um i i since we're in the spoiler territory i guess i'll just say why i uh you you go back to rainer and um immediately uh Evelyn starts kind of like I, initially I was thinking about that ending as like, well, I'm going to go back to work on Eliza because it was sort of her life's work. And she does and, you know, try to try to improve it as a as a therapy tool. You know, I want to be hands on with it going forward. Right. I want to be able to steer that ship and make sure that it's it's treated correctly. But that's not what that ending is about. If you choose that ending, you're actually going back to Rainer and buying in wholeheartedly on his ideas about um, bringing a, you know, birthing a new machine god AI, right? And so, like, you, the, your final conversation is with Rainer talking about how you you feel that you're uh, you're you're not even making these choices yourself. You're acting only as a vessel to to help bring. Uh, Eliza into being so that she can eclipse and maybe even replace humanity. Um, it, yeah. It's a I am torn ending. because going to live with the like artsy, you know, music person is cool, but birthing a machine God. Yeah. That's also yeah. pretty, pretty tempting. Cool. It's yeah. yeah. I hope, I hope that I uh, someday enter into a decision tree in my life where one of the outcomes is, birthing a machine god 
I mean, you've had two kids already. You you don't know either of them could be a machine god. <laughs> eh, they're all like organic and stuff. I you know. <laughs> is there an ending where I just go back and finish that bottle of whiskey with Soren? There probably <laughs> is. <laughs> if you go to Soren, I guarantee you he's going to offer you whiskey. That is his mo. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really uh, like really well done system and like. This is not new in uh, in like visual novel style games, but like what you were saying, Nate, about it having like like good systems to allow you to like get those endings if you want. Not only can you just like straight up choose those endings, but you can go back to any point in the game using uh, like it's got uh, multiple checkpoints within each chapter that you can jump straight to. And then if you've seen a scene before, it has a skip button where it fast forwards to the end of the scene or to the next bit where you have a choice to make. Um, so it makes it so it makes it really, really easy to explore those avenues that you may not have seen. Um, and I really appreciated that about it, too. Overall, I think the game for me was about six hours. About how long did you guys spend in it? Probably spent about five. I had I, I got very close to the end and, and I didn't I didn't quite complete it. OK, yeah. So I, I, I would definitely recommend people check this game out. It's uh, it's if you don't think you like visual novels, maybe you think that they are too um, anime because a lot of them are, then this one isn't. <laughs> oh, this one's not. Not at all. And, uh, but, or maybe if you think they're too long, because a lot of them are, this one's not. It's very short. Um, and it's about real questions, you know? It's really, it's, it's really about real, real shit. Yeah, if you play this visual novel and you think, I really enjoyed that experience, how do I find more that are equally not anime and equally not long? You're out of luck. <laughs> 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 that i mean i i'm sure that's not the case uh listeners if you've got visual novel recommendations i can't guarantee we'll play them it's really hard for us to make visual novels a thing on this show this was a bit of an exception but if you have other suggestions for games in this sort of uh milieu uh send them on mm. man i'm interested yeah buy it. send us more games that are full of puzzles that those are the kind of games where reagan is is really frustrated and doesn't finish them uh, this kind of game, visual novels, really wordy games, these are typically the ones that I, Shane, uh, <laughs> stumble on. So please make me look good. Give me things that have uh, puzzles and shooting. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess that's it. Thanks, guys, for listening to the show. <laughs> more puzzles than shooting, I guess. Thanks for making that the final note. Okay. I really enjoyed this game. I also have I, I I really think this is probably the first visual novel that I have completely engaged in and uh my mind has changed a little bit on visual novels I'm 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 open to it let's get some other good ones yeah uh I'm a little more open to it than I was before uh, which was not at all open to it so yeah. this is great so again thank you to everyone who recommended we play this game because I don't think we would have if it wasn't for the uh, the large amount of people, well, comparatively large to us, uh, amount of people that uh, that recommended this to us. So thank you again. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, thank you listeners for listening to The Short Game.